Welcome back to One on One. I'm your host, Eli Keeler, alongside Anthony Bartiromo. Today, we actually have two very special guests with us. We have Gary Cohen and Bill Snefty. Gary is the founder of the television production company called Triple Threat TV, an Emmy award-winning winning company for producing documentary films. Bill Stephanie was the president of Def Jam Recordings, the CEO of Soul Records and Steps in Music. He was a music producer who produced the hip-hop group Public Enemy, who in 2013 was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Together, Gary and Bill produced Kaepernick and America, a documentary about the controversy and the message around former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick's choice to take a stand by taking a knee during the national anthem just a few years ago. They also talk about, in the documentary, the aftermath of his decision to take a knee and the effect it had on American society today. Gary, Bill, thank you guys so much for coming. Pleasure. Thank you, Eli. Yeah. So we'll just get right into it. First question is kind of a general one. What made you guys say, you know, we want this this topic with this guy? What made you guys pick this topic in Colin Kaepernick? Bill, you're on. Sure. Um, in I'd say 2017 ish, um, I I met Gary, and we were introduced by a uh, uh, a mutual talent agency um, to talk about just doing projects together. As I wanted to move away from uh, my day to day grind. Actually, during that time, I was working at ESPN. And, uh, you know, I was looking for something else to do with my life. And I was just struck with documentary storytelling that was uh, especially so hot at that time. So uh, I meet with Gary and, uh, you know, we we got along famously. We're both from Long Island, which helps. And uh, the first topic I, I think I brought up was the story of uh, of Colin Kaepernick and his actions and his protest. And, uh, you know, from that point on, um, we, we dove into the story and, and his life and everything that surrounded it and, and thought that that was a compelling subject, you know, worthy of a, a documentary treatment. Yeah, let me add that um, <clears throat> Bill, uh, Bill's passion for the subject was personal. He, he loved what Kaepernick did and wanted to learn more about it. And everywhere he turned, you know, sure, you could find voices yelling at each other on, on sports talk radio, you know, good thing to do, bad thing to do, un-American, patriotic, whatever. But finding out real, you know, information, a journalistic treatment of the story, there was none. And, um, and as time went on, that became more and more of a glaring opportunity for us. COVID is the thing that kicked us into gear. Um, COVID, you know, we, I had a production company and I didn't have a project or a paid project. And I said, okay, this is the one we're going to do. And so we started production right in March of 2020 and, um, and, and started telling the story then. What's fascinating about this story is it changed dramatically a few months later when George Floyd was murdered. So Obviously, on one hand, what do you mean? Colin Kaepernick did what he did, and that was long before anything happened with George Floyd. How could George Floyd change it? Well, George Floyd changed a whole lot of things around race in America and the way the public saw racial issues. And, you know, and the, the, you know, the idea after George Floyd was like, oh, this is what Colin Kaepernick was talking about. This is, you know, this is now we know, now we understand. So, um, so our film changed after we started it, and uh, I, you know, I'd like to think it changed for the better. And now the film is out. We're excited about it. Um, we believe that Colin Kaepernick did something extraordinary that deserves to be celebrated and examined, and and you know, and and evaluated. Um, you know, and uh, the response to the film so far has been wonderful. It's just been great. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, another thing, speaking on more of how there was no really like documentation or journalism about Kaepernick's story, what kind of insight did you guys get like working with the production and working with the stories you hear that might not necessarily show up on the screen or on the documentary? Well, the biggest thing, the, the number one reveal for me um, was how the reaction to Kaepernick captured a moment in time in American history. It was 2016, it was the back half of 2016. 
um, you know, football season. So September, October, November. Um, and, um, and the heated response to that's un-American or that's really patriotic or whatever your take on it was, was in the zeitgeist at the same time as Donald Trump's candidacy and the very polarized national election of 2016 between Trump and Hillary. And, um, and that's what sort of elevated the story to in, in the public's awareness. Um, and so, you know, it's almost like, you know, Hillary sort of tried, wasn't the extreme left, you know, she was trying to, you know, be sort of the middle. Trump was, at least in the politics of the moment, the extreme right or appealing to extreme right. Kaepernick filled the opposing part, of, if, they, if they were bookends, Kaepernick fit on this bookend more than Hillary in all kinds of ways. So that I didn't realize until it was years later and we were looking back and you look at the discourse and you go, oh yeah, now that all makes sense. And, uh, you know, so that was the number one reveal for me. Bill, how about you? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think there are two levels. Um, you know, there is definitely the high level of, oh, wow, this is a subject that is in the center of our political discourse, even at the presidential level. But then there is actually the on the ground level. And I remember specifically a story, I think it was around 2018, there was a, a holiday event, uh, a family in North Carolina um, got together. And during the family event, a heated discussion ensued uh, between the uh, the members to which the father, the patriarch of the family, shot his son over disagreements uh, about whether or not NFL athletes should be kneeling uh, during games. So you know, the uh, the debate of what Kaepernick's actions meant, where we were going politically, you know, were, were such that a father would shoot his son. You know, over it, and and you know, there are probably very few instances, um, in in the course of telling stories, where you get something that resonates from uh, holiday dinner tables to uh, the battle for the White House, and uh, definitely Kaepernick's action has uh, precipitated those sorts of discussions and debates. Yeah, you talk about the amount of just polarization one and the just sheer hate that went towards Kaepernick from an amazing amount of people and it went to a point there's a scene in the documentary where they point out that Kaepernick's mom not his birth mom but his adopted mom actually went on Twitter social media went to call out Colin Kaepernick speak out against him protesting and at that point in the documentary I'm thinking literally just there's no one on this man's side besides Eric. <laughs> just everybody hates this guy. So, and I'm thinking to myself, how can someone possibly withstand this? Because even though there were people on his side, they weren't really represented well in the media. Um, what do you guys think about Kaepernick made him able or made him strong enough or whatever to keep powering through so much hate, sacrifice, you know, money, his job, his platform even? What do you guys think about him really took him through that? Go ahead, Bill. Well, yeah, I, I, I think he um, clearly had a level of resolve about the, the subject, the topic itself. And uh, you know, throughout the film, you know, he makes it very clear that uh, you know, he's committed to, to the issue, that it was personal to him. Maybe not so much directly growing up in Turlock, California, but as he wound his way through college and then you know, becoming an, an NFL, not only player, but leader, he started to encounter all sorts of different stories of, of, of teammates and friends who had their own direct encounters with, with law enforcement. So I think to the extent that it became personal for him, that may have you know, given him the necessary foundation that we've seen throughout history, whether it is, you know, John Carlos and, and Tommy Smith or Muhammad Ali or, or Jackie Robinson, 
or Billie Jean King. We, we've seen athletes who've decided to take a stand no matter what it meant to their career, to their income, to their, their lives, that they felt that there was a specific issue that they were passionate about and that uh, they were willing to endure the slings and arrows of whatever came to them. Uh, just one correction for you, Eli. The the person who spoke up was his birth mother, Heidi Russo. Oh, was birth mother. She okay. was the one who who tweeted uh, publicly. His adoptive mother, Teresa Kaepernick, uh, did not. Okay. She's she's okay. never really spoken publicly. You know, she doesn't have a social media presence. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Sure. No. It's you know it it's um, from my standpoint. What Kaepernick did is extraordinary because there have been many, many thousands of players in the NFL and in baseball and basketball and all kinds of public spheres of influence. He's the only one that's ever taken on this kind of a protest on this kind of a sustained level. You know, he had just, he was a year into a hundred million dollar contract. He was a starting NFL quarterback who had been to the Super Bowl. And um, he was very well aware from the beginning, and, and it's very clear in the telling of the story in the film, he knew what he was doing. He understood the stakes from the beginning. Um, you know, in, in the first interview he gave Steve Weish, he said, if they take football away from me, my endorsements, that'll be okay, because I'll know I'm doing the right thing. Later, he was asked, suppose, you know, some crazy person decides to you know, kill you for this. He said, well, that would only prove my point. And it's that level of commitment from individuals that changes the world and that creates, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of event that he created. And to me, this is an extraordinary thing. And uh, it's easy to view with cynicism um, for, you know, cynical types, um, but that kind of idealism and principled behavior is, you know, really admirable to me and to me it's the you know it is the definition of being patriotic and american to you know to call the country out on things that you believe need to be addressed um and so i find it profoundly ironic that the language used against him is unpatriotic and un-american you know it's like uh, it's fascinating um and the other thing that i will say is that you know, it keeps, for me anyway, and I'm the white guy in this pair. Really? Uh, <laughs> well, it's radio, Bill, you know? <laughs> um, for me, it just keeps pointing back to race. You know, it's like, it, it just, all the dog whistles to, you know, to the people that, you know, have those points of view <clears throat> were called in on this one. And, um, and just, you know, ultimately, you know, became an ugly scene. Exactly. Yeah. We live in a time in the United States where people in power, like athletes like Kaepernick, they're just polarized as ever. Um, what would you think that Cap's message applies to nowadays, going back to like Kaepernick, George Floyd, Trayvon Martin? And uh, what steps do you think need to be made still like today to carry out his message? Um, doing what we're doing here uh, to have further conversations about his actions and all of the related issues connected to his actions with the hope, and I would underline hope, that those conversations then translate to real action, which can be legislative, which can be political, which can be business-oriented. You know, there are all sorts of categories and, and, and sectors of society that have to be impacted in order for us to, to move forward. Now, for me, you know, the Kaepernick story is not a new one. We've seen it before. Kaepernick 30 years ago was called Rodney King, where we had a law enforcement illegal beating of, of a, uh, a driver on a Los Angeles highway that was caught on, on video, which beyond what happened here with, uh, you know, the, the four to five years of aftermath of, of Collins' actions, uh, the city of Los Angeles burned 
in, uh, in 1992 after the verdict which acquitted the police officers in the beating of, of Rodney King. So, you know, we, we've seen this movie before, literally. In fact, I worked on a movie in 1989 called Do the Right Thing. I had produced the group Public Enemy, and uh, we had created a song called Fight the Power that served as the ongoing theme to drive action in uh, Spike Lee's movie of uh, of that year which was centered on the beating of a young black man in brooklyn so you know to the extent that you know we're always dealing with these issues of a race as we've done for for 400 now plus years um you know we understand that the idea is trying to manifest these conversations and discussions into real action for improvement and i'll tell you straight up that, uh, you know, would Bill Stephanie in 1940 uh, have uh, discussions on WFUV or something related to Fordham University, um, you know, 70 years ago or 80 years ago? Probably not, because society has engaged in real reform that allows us to come together. We just need to continue the process, I believe. And, and one thing I'd like to just sort of point out to about the about our film is, um, our film is targeted at people like you guys, young people who are open to listening, uh, people in the media, pe journalists, so on and so forth. And our distribution strategy leans heavily into getting the film in front of university and high school audiences in educated constructs, first to see the film, and then hopefully wherever possible to engage in conversation around it. And so we're creating events at all kinds of levels. And in fact, our appearance today on One on One is the outgrowth of a conversation with Fordham University about screening the film on campus and then having discussion afterwards. So, the, you know, what Bill is talking about is, you know, a little bit of that, I think it's a Gandhi quote, be the change you want to, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's like, this is what we believe in. This is what we care about. And this is a way to engage in conversation that will change minds one mind at a time. And that's, you know, that's the only way I know how to do it. Yeah. You talk about open-mindedness there, which, you know, is obviously really important. And um, a, another scene from the movie, part of the movie was when you guys talked about how Colin Kaepernick and met up with Nate Boyer, a former Green Beret. Um, turned college long snapper played a game in the NFL um so how important do you think open-mindedness is because at the time I was just a kid then so I wasn't watching the news but I don't know how big of a thing in the media it was that these people from totally different sides were talking having a discussion and I don't really think that was represented well this is kind of a two-parter but how do you think this situation would have played out differently if it was represented well and also how important is it to represent both sides having a discussion you know together how important is that for growth yeah great questions um you know i was i you know i didn't know until we dove into the research for the film that nate boyer that a green beret was the guy who suggested he take a knee uh and and for those of you that don't know the story, Kaepernick's original protest, he sat during the national anthem. And what happened was Nate Boyer was a 49ers fan uh, and a you know, well-known person in military circles. And he was invited to write a column in the Army Times, which is a little newsletter for servicemen. Uh, and he wrote an open letter to Colin Kaepernick in which he said how he was disappointed by the protest. And, how he was a fan and he tried to remain open-minded, but it felt like disrespect and so on and so forth. And Kaepernick reached out to Boyer outside of the media and arranged for the two of them to meet. And in that conversation, Nate's, you know, Cap said to, to Nate, hey, what could I do that would show my sense of purpose and, and further the protest and be more respectful to people in the military. And it was Nate's idea that by taking a knee, which is a gesture that you assume when you ask your, your hoped for bride to marry you, or when you go to a cemetery and you're honoring the dead, 
or when an injured player on the football field, you know, gets carried off by taking a knee, Nate believed that Cap would be expressing himself in a way that was appropriate and so on and so forth. And you are absolutely right that as much as that was told, and it was when we did the research, he, Nate appeared on a bunch of shows telling his story. Some reason that story didn't stick with the public. All that stuck was Cap did this thing, isn't it awful or is it awful? Is there a problem or isn't there a problem? And the details were lost. And so um, to me, I think that's you know a fascinating component of it. And I also think that it points to the challenge that these kinds of stories have, because when you talk about two sides of the story, people do not consume their media for the most part these days in, in two-sided environments. If you're listening to MSNBC or CNN, you're hearing one story. If you're hearing Fox News, you're hearing another. And you can insert 100 news organizations. There just isn't a whole lot of business being done in the middle. And as such, it's a challenge to, to create those dialogues. Bill, yeah. Yeah, ag ag agreed. Yeah, it's funny, when I was in college, um, we were just coming out of, and I, I worked in college radio um, at Adelphi University on Long Island. We had to learn something called the Fairness Doctrine, which was actually a federal policy when you broadcast that you had to provide two sides to controversial issues, um, you know, on air. So you know, I, I'm oriented in the uh, the notion that. You, you, a dialogue is always two sides. You know, anything else is a monologue. And perhaps part of the difficulty that we have processing Colin Kaepernick's actions or, or you know, anything else socially is, is that, and, and Dr. King, Martin Luther King, um, had the great line that, you know, we have to exist more in dialogue rather than monologue. And, and you know, that was the challenge, I think, in telling uh, this story and, and hopefully it instigates more dialogue. Definitely. Um, what do you say, Eli? Do we have time for one more question? If, if you guys are okay, we could ask one more quick one. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. So one last question. Um, what do you think, um, how much of the burden do you think falls on Kaepernick in a, uh, in comparison to other players with like Kaepernick sort of starting this movement and other players following it, what would you say is like uh, like the main uh, burden, I guess, in uh, this movement? Where he bears the, the weight of moving things forward um, or that the players in some way or some fashion should also be bearing you know, some additional weight as as well that it isn't left to him is, it, is that what you're asking yeah that's what i mean yeah sorry i kind of worded yeah. that weirdly yeah but... yeah no 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 problem I, you know it's i don't think it's it's on any of them it's on us you know and you know quite frankly i think colin kaepernick did his job and did it well that he wanted to bring attention to the issues of excessive law enforcement illegal or uh, or you know destructive actions of of law enforcement especially as it uh, pertained to interactions with young black men um i, I think he did and some of the players a after him uh, eric reed and others did probably as much as you can expect from nfl athletes um and you know perhaps there's some instruction about where we're at as a society, where it isn't government, it isn't you know agencies and org organizations. We used to have civil rights organizations 50, 60 years ago that were you know in leadership on, on these issues. That now it's NFL players, it's rappers, you know, it's actors. You know, we're we're looking to folks who we wouldn't expect to be in leadership on these very difficult issues to, to guide us. So, um, you know, maybe it allows us to reflect, to see where we're at, you know, all, all of us on how we move things forward. Well said. Yeah. I, oh, oh, thank you. That really was, yeah. 
if you want to add anything, Gary, you're more than welcome. Otherwise, we can wrap You know, up. listen, I, I feel like, you know, Colin Kaepernick is a hero for our times. Um, and what he did was profoundly difficult. You don't get to be a hero by doing something that's easy. And he put himself out in front. And we all know that the trailblazers catch the arrows. Um, so, you know, yes, he did that. He chose to. He was moved to do it. And, you know, and life goes on. <clears throat> I do think, you know, like Bill, the issues he raised, I believe strongly need attention and need dialogue. And my hope is our film, you know, contributes in some small way to that. And, you know, and we walk through the world on a daily basis, uh, you know, with all kinds of choices to move the needle in the direction that matters to us. And this is the way we're doing it. Thank, thank you guys so much for coming on again. Your answers were incredibly powerful meaningful and i'm sure your movie is going to create a lot of conversation here on fordham i watched it i'm going to go to the screening again i'd love to talk about it so thank you guys so much for coming on um with that being said we're going to send it back to the studio um it's going to be me and anthony after the break we're going to talk some yankees mets so see you then let's go mets thank you let's go mets thank you eli thank you anthony <laughs> thanks guys